Hello, I'm Faustino Ramos. I'm a pediatric cardiologist with UT Physicians and the Children's Memorial Hermann. I practice at the Pediatric Subspecialty Clinic at Memorial Hermann the Woodlands. Uh, my background is that I'm from California originally. I uh, went to Harvard undergrad and Cornell Medical School. Uh, I did my pediatric cardiology fellowship at UT Southwestern and I've been practicing pediatric cardiology since 2008. Today I'll be talking to you about pre-participation cardiac screening. The spring and summertime are the busiest time of the year for pediatric cardiologists with all the children wanting to participate in sports and getting ready for the new year. Uh, there's a lot of patients that come to see us to make sure that they're healthy and uh, safe to participate in sports. So we're going to review some of the uh, things that we do in the office when these children come to see us for consultation. We're going to review some of the information that we know on sudden cardiac death. Uh, we're going to review the basics of pre-participation cardiac screening that we do in the office, as well as review some of the updated criteria for interpreting EKGs in athletes. And at the end, we'll finish by briefly summarizing some of the additional testing that is available for children uh, that fail the initial screening. Sudden cardiac death is probably one of uh, the worst nightmares uh, a parent or family can go through. Uh, sudden cardiac death uh, occurs in all our communities and when it happens it's, uh, it's a tragedy for the family, for the community, for the school. Uh, and after one of these events we see uh, an uptick in the number of referrals to the office uh, to screen uh, possibly other, children, uh, other siblings that may be at risk and relatives and, uh, and just neighbors that are uh, coming in because of concerned parents. Uh, the difficulty with sudden cardiac death is that we don't have a good idea of exactly how big the problem is because we don't have a national registry. Uh, some of the best information that we have on the statistics of sudden cardiac death comes from the work uh, produced by Dr. Barry Marin and his group in Minneapolis. This pie chart shows a breakdown of uh, causes of sudden cardiac death over a 25-year period and this is collected from the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation Registry. As you can see, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy causes about one-third of these cases of sudden death. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic problem in which the heart muscle becomes abnormally enlarged and abnormally thick, and that's not due to sports or hypertension. Uh, the muscle just continues to grow uncontrollably, and it puts the athlete at risk of death when they're doing uh, vigorous exercise. There's also uh, a significant number of children that have a thick heart, but not quite thick enough to, uh, to classify them as having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. These athletes are also at risk uh, because they can develop uh, dangerous arrhythmias that can cause them to go into an unstable rhythm and cause them to collapse and die suddenly. Another significant cause of sudden death are these coronary artery anomalies, and we'll review these in a couple of slides uh, towards the end. Myocarditis is an inf uh, a viral infection of the heart uh, that can occur after a severe illness like a bad flu. Um, and these other uh, uh, less common conditions uh, are some of the arrhythmias and, uh, and valvular problems that occur in the heart. Our knowledge of sudden cardiac death is expanding uh, as studies like Barry, Dr. Barry Marin's group continue to collect the data over the years. What's also important to realize is uh, sudden cardiac death can occur from acquired conditions, such as myocarditis following a bad viral illness. Uh, genetic conditions evolve over time. For example, the, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a genetic condition that a patient is born with, but the abnormal thickness in the heart may not manifest itself until the child is in their preteen years or in adolescence. So it's always important to pay attention to new symptoms, and we'll review what those concerning symptoms may be. For the pediatricians and the family practitioners and the athletic trainers that are doing these, uh, these physicals on these athletes, it's very important to do an annual history and physical for these reasons. Genetic conditions evolve, new symptoms appear. The pre-participation screening um, has several different components. The American Heart Association uh, consensus panel uh, proposed 
12 areas that need to be reviewed on an annual basis for any child that wants to play sports, uh, beginning with the family history. Anytime a child comes in to see me and wants to play sports, I ask them if there's a family history of anyone having been born with a heart defect, anyone that uh, needed heart surgery at a young age, a baby, a teenager, a young adult, uh, anyone that had died suddenly at a young age, again, a baby, a teenager, a young adult uh, that had a, uh, a sudden death. We ask them about uh, any uh, symptoms, concerning symptoms, such as uh, you know, murmurs, chest pain, uh, fatigue, dizziness, passing out. Passing out with, with vigorous physical activity is especially concerning. That's a big red flag. Chest pain as well. Chest pain that occurs with, uh, with vis vigorous physical activity is also a big red flag. When we examine uh, the patients in the office, we pay particular attention to the murmurs, uh, the pulses in their legs, and any phys physical features that suggest an underlying condition like Marfan syndrome. And we'll review what, what Marfan syndrome looks like uh, in a couple of slides. Their blood pressure is also very important. It's important to realize that in this list of 12 items uh, recommended by the American Heart Association, a screening EKG is not part of the recommended screening for an athlete. The International Olympic Committee and FIFA do recommend EKGs and perform EKGs on all of their athletes, but that's not something that we're doing here in the U.S. at the moment. There are uh, EKG screenings that are being done on a population basis in other countries, such as Japan and Italy. And we're hopeful that at some point in the future we'll develop the means uh, by which to screen all, uh, all of our teenage athletes going forward. But at the moment, the EKG is not, uh, is not a required component for the pre-participation screening. And we'll review that uh, as well uh, in a, uh, slides towards the end of the presentation. So how are we doing with the basic history and physical? Um, this was a, an article that was published again by Dr. Barry Marin's group in Minneapolis in 2006. Uh, and this was very interesting. They surveyed all of the athletic trainers and team physicians in all 122 professional teams. So that includes the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, professional hockey, and Major League Soccer. So the, Dr. Barry Marin's group interviewed all the athletic trainers and team physicians and asked them how often they performed the history and physical on their athletes. Well, 100% of the teams performed the annual history and physical based on the league recommendations, but none of them covered all 12 points recommended by the American Heart Association. And I thought that was, this is very interesting. You, know, you have professional sports teams that have you know, millions and millions, if not billions of dollars at their disposal and they've made a very large investment in contracting one of these athletes, and yet the team physicians and the athletic trainers aren't covering the, the basic 12 points recommended by the American Heart Association. It's, uh, I think we can do a lot better in our communities. Sometimes we, we get patients referred to us when they've, uh, the child has already had uh, an EKG done somewhere else, and they're referred because, of the e because the EKG was abnormal, but no one has taken the time to get an accurate family history or perform a careful physical exam. And I think that's the problem that we see ourselves getting into in a situation like this, where we have technology available and we're wanting technology to replace some of the basics. Again, the, the, the careful history and physical. And we can't let ourselves fall into that trap. The family history is very, very important. Um, again, when a patient comes in to see me in the office, I'll ask them if there's uh, ever been a, uh, a family member that was born with heart defect, anyone that needed heart surgery at a young age, anyone that died suddenly as a baby, a teenager, young adult. Uh, is there a family history of congenital deafness, pacemakers, defibrillators, seizures? Uh, the family history, the, the causes of sudden cardiac death that have a genetic basis cover the gamut, to cover the spectrum from arrhythmias to structural heart defects to cardiomyopathies. And again, if you look at the pie chart uh, from Dr. Marin's group, uh, you can see the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is, a, uh, again, a genetic condition. Uh, arrhythmias, uh, arrhythmias are also a very important 
part of sudden death, uh, and the structural of the heart defects, such as mitral valve prolapse, aortic stenosis. So the family history is, is very, very important here. We, we ask patients about uh, a history of murmurs, hypertension, fatigue, uh, syncope, chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, palpitations. In truth, these symptoms are very, very common reasons for referral for, to a pediatric cardiologist. For the primary care physicians out there that are taking care of the children, uh, it's, this can be a very difficult area for them because a murmur can be uh, an innocent murmur when there's no heart defects. It's just a, a part of uh, normal childhood development. However, a murmur can also be due to a serious condition, such as aortic stenosis, subaortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertension, uh, as well, is, is, very, uh, is becoming increasingly prevalent in our children as they continue to gain weight and uh, are out of shape. Uh, sometimes kids come from families where there's a very strong family history of hypertension and everyone has essential hypertension. However, that hypertension can also be a reflection of an underlying cardiac condition called the coarctation, which requires surgery. Fatigue is also a very common complaint in our office. And uh, you know, sometimes I'll joke with a parent, you know, what, what teenager do they, do they know of that isn't fatigued? But fatigue can be, uh, can be an underlying uh, uh, marker for heart disease or, or a heart muscle, um, heart muscle problem, such as a cardiomyopathy. Dizziness and fainting are also very common complaints, and oftentimes they're the garden variety uh, vasovagal syncope that people experience when they see blood or needles or, or see something, um, something shocking. Uh, but syncope uh, or passing out can also can also be due to a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or an arrhythmia. So the point here is that there are a variety of different symptoms that are very common, but a small number of these patients with, with seemingly common symptoms can have a serious underlying cardiac condition as the cause for those symptoms. So the primary care physician needs to be able to uh, distinguish those normal, innocent conditions from the more serious conditions and be able to make judicious referral to a pediatric cardiologist. As a pediatric cardiologist, I'm happy to see these patients in the office all the time because I have additional testing available at my disposal that will help me distinguish the innocent common condition from the more serious conditions that require additional investigation, therapy, surgery, or limitation from sports. We're going to review some of the, uh, some of the important findings here on physical exam. We're not, I'm not going to discuss um, the evaluation of murmurs um, because uh, that's going to be a, a more lengthier discussion. I'm going to discuss the importance of uh, measuring the pulses in the legs and uh, evaluating patients for the stigmata of Marfan's syndrome. Uh, and the reason why these two things are important is because um, coarctation is, uh, is a condition that is a congenital heart defect that often goes unrecognized for many, many, many years. There are some adults, adult patients, with hypertension that is not, not, that is not able to be controlled with blood pressure medication because it's due to an underlying heart condition, an abnormality in one of the arteries that requires surgery, and the hypertension will not get better until the surgery is performed. We see this problem occur in children as well. Um, with Marfan syndrome, uh, we're going to review here uh, how you can identify patients that may have this condition. Marfan syndrome, um, pa patients with Marfan syndrome have a characteristic body build. People think that President Abraham Lincoln may have had Marfan syndrome. Uh, these individuals are very, very tall and thin. Uh, typically they have long, slender fingers, um, very hypermobile, flexible joints. Uh, on the right hand of the uh, of the slide are all the are all are the various different uh, physical skeletal features that someone can have with Marfan syndrome. If you look at the uh, at the center picture here, if a patient is able to bend their thumb and extend it beyond their palm, that is called the thumb sign. If they can encircle their wrist 
with their thumb and small finger and basically uh, bring their hand out through that circle that's the wrist sign these two signs together give you uh, give the patient three points on this uh, on this skeletal survey a total of seven points is considered a positive systemic score and is suggestive of Marfan syndrome this condition here on the bottom left is called a pectus excavatum where the breastbone has an indentation uh, has a kind of a sunken in appearance on the right hand side this is a pectus carinatum where the breastbone sticks out uh, this the pectus carinatum is a little bit more characteristic for Marfan syndrome and this gives the patient two points on the scale whereas the pectus excavatum only gives him one so if the patient has the thumb and wrist sign and the pectus excavatum carinatum already they have five points and they only need two more to have a positive skeletal score for Marfan syndrome but that's not enough to diagnose Marfan syndrome the patient also has to have aortic root dilation uh, and we'll review what that looks like uh, in the upcoming slides. Ectopulentis is a, a particularly interesting problem. This is a, a dislocation of the lens of the eye, and it causes patients to be nearsighted, have very blurred vision, and astigmatisms. This condition is so strongly associated with Marfan syndrome that if the patient has ectopulentis, it almost guarantees that they have Marfan syndrome. They still have to have some root dilation, however, and then they're considered having Marfan. Um, Marfan syndrome came to uh, national attention this past year during the NBA draft. There was a there was a young athlete that was a you know um, a basketball star and was slated to be drafted in the first round and was discovered to have this condition. And interestingly enough, he had had this condition, the ectopulentis and surgery performed for this condition at a younger age, but uh, the association with Marfan syndrome was not made at that time. EKGs are being done increasingly in our communities uh, as part of screening programs uh, that are being organized by some of the school districts. And there's, there's a lot of debate whether the EKGs should or should not be done as part of the pre-participation sports screening. Um, there are several advantages of doing an EKG as part of the EKG screening program, uh, as part of the pre-participation athletic screening program. Uh, the EKG can screen for arrhythmias and heart enlargement all at the same time. Uh, we can train lay people to perform the EKGs. The EKG is relatively inex inexpensive, it's portable, and you can screen lots and lots of athletes all in one afternoon or, or during one weekend. However, there are some cons to these EKGs. It will not, the EKG will not detect all causes of sudden cardiac death. Athletic conditioning may also produce physiologic adaptations that may mimic disease on the EKG, which leads to a false positive, which then causes you know, familiar, you know, anxiety in the family, which results in additional testing and additional expense. These EKGs have to be interpreted by uh, a medical person because the machine's interpretation may not always be accurate, and I have seen that occur many, many times. And finally, we, the cost of screening needs to be addressed, and this is very important if we're going to develop a national program for screening all our athletes. This, these tables here summarize the, the new criteria that came out a couple of years ago on interpreting EKGs in athletes. There are several physiologic adaptations in athletes that are now increasingly, uh, increasingly recognized as normal. Athletes can have a very low resting heart rate simply because of their aerobic conditioning. As long as the heart rate is greater than 30 beats per minute and they're not having any concerning symptoms such as fatigue or dizziness or passing out, that's normal. Sinus arrhythmia is also normal and there's several other things here that you can see in this first panel that are now considered normal EKG findings in athletes. I'm going to review number eight briefly because we're going to show a couple of slides uh, uh, coming up uh, how, uh, how this can impact uh, an EKG interpretation in an athlete. The EKG can be a, a good screening test for uh, heart enlargement or 
left ventricular hypertrophy. Isolated voltage criteria for left ventricular hypertrophy are now considered normal as long as they don't have any other abnormalities that also suggest enlargement, such as left, left axis deviation, left atrial enlargement, ST segment depression, T wave, T wave inversion, or pathologic Q waves. And we'll see an example of that next. Conversely, over here on the right side in table one, these are all the uh, these are all the findings that are still considered abnormal in athletes. When we're doing large uh, numbers of EKGs as part of a, a screening program for children, whether they're athletes or not, these are some of the EKG abnormalities that we may come across. And some of them may be incidental findings. The children may not have any symptoms whatsoever. This is what we can find. Uh, on occasion by doing a large number of screening EKGs. Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome uh, is a, an electrical abnormality that presupposes children to develop a very fast, uh, potentially dangerous heart rhythm. Long QT syndrome also is another arrhythmia that it has a genetic basis, as does Brugada syndrome, and catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is an example of a child that came to see me <coughs> a couple of months ago in the office because he had had a screening EKG done elsewhere that was reported as abnormal. This was a 12-year-old athlete that played baseball and basketball. He had no symptoms, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, um, no palpitations, had never passed out. He had a normal family history. There's no history of sudden cardiac death or congenital heart disease. He had a normal exam normal blood pressure, normal pulses, no murmurs. The EKG was a routine EKG that was ordered as part of his pre-participation screening, and the EKG was read as possible left ventricular hypertrophy with early repolarization. And now he had to see me to, to clear him. This is an example of a patient that wouldn't necessarily require a screening EKG. He has no symptoms. There's no family history. He has a normal exam. He did not need the EKG as part of his pre-participation screening, but because the, the EKG was interpreted as showing this possible LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, and early repulsation, now he had to see me. Well, in fact, this is a normal athletic uh, uh, teenager's EKG. As we saw in the previous slide, these, these findings are now recognized as normal in an athlete. He does have the prominent voltages that suggest the left ventricular hypertrophy or, or cardiac enlargement, but he doesn't have any other of the other associated abnormalities that would be red flags. So this patient is cleared to participate in sports, and he does not need additional testing. He does not need an echocardiogram. Interestingly enough, that same day, I saw this patient, and he also wanted to play sports. Now, at first blush, you might look at the EKG and say, well, it looks very similar to the previous one. Well, why don't we get a history here? This patient had a history of a large patent ductus arteriosus. This is an extra artery that we're all born with that did not close and uh, started causing him problems. And then he developed a viral myocarditis. This is a viral inflammation of the heart muscle, which weakened the heart. He developed heart failure and a dilated cardiomyopathy. He had an echocardiogram in 2011 that showed a dilated left ventricle with a decreased ejection fraction. Normal is going to be greater than 55, so his heart function was weak. He had been on um, a variety of different medications to help his heart function, but those were stopped abruptly when the family moved to Louisiana, and uh, the patient didn't have any symptoms, so they didn't restart the medication. But now the family moved back to Houston and came to see me because the child wants to play sports. His family history is benign. There's no family history of sudden death or, or heart disease. He has a very loud murmur on exam. So are we going to clear this patient or refer him? So in this situation, the history alone is, the history and physical really, is, is, is enough to say this patient cannot play sports until he sees a cardiologist. To do an EKG beforehand is, is premature. That the patient needs to see a cardiologist and get reevaluated to see where his was where his function is. He may need to be back on some of those medications. 
If we look at this child's EKG a little bit more closely, we're going to find that there are several abnormalities that you may not have noticed at first, uh, at first glance. He has a junctional rhythm. The electrical conduction, conduction through his heart is not proceeding in the normal fashion. Uh, the heart axis is deviated to the left. He has heart enlargement, as indicated by the prominent voltages in, in the mid-precordial leads. The T waves are inverted and the ST segments are depressed. All of these things indicate cardiac enlargement with strain. This is a very, very abnormal EKG. So when we find EKGs like this, there are a variety of different secondary tests that we can do in our office that will help us identify the problem and, uh, and prescribe appropriate treatment and management for these patients. We can do an echocardiogram. Uh, we can uh, order a 24-hour uh, Holter monitor to evaluate their heart rhythm over a longer period of time. On select patients, we can refer them for treadmill stress testing to evaluate um, their heart rhythm, blood pressure, or symptoms with exercise. And with patients with certain types of arrhythmias, uh, they may need additional invasive uh, studying with an electrophysiology study and ablation. This, uh, this group of uh, images shows the types of views that we obtain uh, on echocardiogram and the different types of uh, heart conditions that they help identify. Over here on the left hand side, this is a picture of the aortic valve with the origin of the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery on the, uh, on the opposite side. These two small arteries are the small blood vessels that supply the heart muscle itself with oxygen and with blood. It's important to note that when we do the echocardiogram, we're not looking for cholesterol in these vessels. We, we can't see blockage or cholesterol deposits in these arteries. We're simply looking for the anatomical origin of the arteries. Are they coming out of the, uh, out of the valve from the correct spot? Here in the center, we can see the mitral valve, uh, the aortic valve here, the left ventricular, uh, the left lower chamber, the left ventricle here, and the wall that separates the left, uh, the left ventricle from the right ventricle. <coughs> And this is a, an apical four-chamber projection uh, showing all four chambers in one picture. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, we've discussed at the beginning. This is, a, uh, this is a genetic condition that causes an abnormal enlargement of the heart muscle. And you can see here on the left side, this patient may have had um, some hypertension. The heart muscle is a little bit thicker than you would normally see. Um, and it looks like this patient may have died from a from a heart attack here, there's a little area of infarct. On an echocardiogram, this is what, the, uh, what that patient's heart may have looked like here on the left. Whereas on the right, this is a patient who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and the heart muscle is abnormally enlarged, and it's not because of hypertension. Uh, it's simply because they have a genetic problem that is causing the heart muscle to enlarge and thicken uh, at an uncontrollable rate. Patients are born with this condition, but the thickness may not manifest itself until the teenage years, or, or in some cases, even uh, young adulthood, people in their 20s and 30s. This is a, a dilated cardiomyopathy, um, similar to that uh, second EKG with the boy that had the viral myocarditis. On the right side, you see that the heart muscle is very dilated and the walls are very thin. With the echocardiogram, we can see the contractility of that muscle is decreased in comparison to, to normal. So this would be what that patient looked like with a decreased ejection fraction and a dilated heart. On the echocardiogram, we can evaluate for aortic root dilation, uh, which is uh, an abnormal enlargement of that main artery coming out of the heart the aorta supplies the oxygenated blood to our brain, uh, and to, our, to our muscles, to all the body. People who have a bicuspid aortic valve or Marfan syndrome can have abnormal enlargement of that artery. So the aortic valve here looks like a Mercedes-Benz sign when we, when we see it on the echocardiogram. This patient here has a bicuspid aortic valve. All three leaflets are present, but two of the leaflets are fused together and do not separate. So it functions as if there are only two leaflets, hence the term bicuspid. 
This is what the surgeon would see in the operating room. Three leaflets, but two of them are fused together. This is a functionally bicuspid valve. Patients with this condition can develop uh, aortic root enlargement that can progress gradually over many, many years and decades. So again, at the top right panel, this is a normal aortic root. This root is mildly enlarged, and this one is severely enlarged. When patients develop aortic root enlargement, we have to, uh, once it crosses a certain, certain threshold, we have to tell them that they cannot uh, participate in contact sports because of the risk of, uh, because of the risk of rupturing that artery, uh, which could be catastrophic and cause a sudden death on the field. So again, we see this enlargement occur with bicuspid aortic valve and in patients with Marfan syndrome. Coronary artery anomalies, we, if you remember from the pie chart, are also a very important cause of sudden death. Uh, these, can, these abnormalities can present with chest pain, uh, syncope during sports, or uh, just sudden cardiac arrest with exercise. The, the frightening thing here is that oftentimes there are no preceding signs or symptoms before someone can just collapse and die with this condition. On the lower left we see the normal origin of the left coronary artery coming here from, uh, from the left side of the valve. In the center panel we see that the left coronary artery is coming, is coming from the opposite side and traveling between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Here in the cartoon we see how that can become a problem. This is the left coronary artery taking a very long course coming from the opposite sinus of Valsalva. What happens during exercise is that the blood pressure increases in both of the arteries and it can squeeze that main blood supply to half of the heart. And the, the athlete will suddenly collapse and, and die suddenly. Um, this happened to a very, very famous basketball player about 30 years ago. He uh, was an NBA All-Star in the Hall of Fame. He retired from the NBA after having suffered a knee injury. and. Uh, a couple of years later, after he retired, he, he died suddenly during a pickup game of basketball at his church. And on autopsy, he was discovered to have this condition. So, in conclusion, uh, an EKG is a, supplement, uh, a supplementary test. It's not a substitute to a good history and physical exam. Uh, and this is important because acquired conditions occur, such as the viral myocarditis. Genetic conditions evolve over time, such as the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or root dilation in the cases of patients with bicuspid valve or Marfan syndrome. And new symptoms can appear as these acquired conditions occur and genetic uh, conditions uh, evolve over time. Therefore, it's very, very important to do an annual history and physical. The, the primary care physician needs to do this every year on every athlete. It's mandatory. When the patients fail their screening test, whether it's uh, new, uh, new, uh, uh, new occurrences in the family history, new developments in the, new developments in the family history, new symptoms, uh, or um, you know, new findings, then we can do secondary testing when appropriate in consultation with a cardiologist. We're always available and happy to see your patients at any time. Thank you.